Well, hello and welcome back, everybody. I'm Dan John. This is danjohnuniversity.com. This is our podcast. We come out every week with this. Remember, if you have questions, uh, email them to us at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. Um, it's sometimes difficult to answer every question. Often I'll email you and in some cases call you if you leave a phone number. Uh, a lot of people have come up to me at workshops and said how much, how interesting that was when I did that. So uh, I'm here. This is episode 197 of the podcast. Uh, obviously, we're coming in for a, big, a new big number here. But I just want to thank each and every one of you for listening and asking these good questions. Uh, our first question today is from Jason. I have used back squats throughout my time spent strength training. However, I want to incorporate the front and overhead squats into my training. Before I even start, Jason, I don't know how many times I've said on this podcast and workshops and lectures that the order I teach the squat family is this. Goblet squat, goblet squat to overhead squat, overhead squat, front squat, back squat, and then if there's any other variations, I've had an occasional person ask for like Zercher squats. The reason I do that is I feel that if you can overhead squat, the front squat and the back squat are fairly easy to teach. Um, you've been doing back squats a long time, and, and that's great. Uh, um, back in the 70s, I remember Kim Goss telling me that he went to this training thing, and they kept saying the answer to all questions is back squats. It's funny because at another training thing, they said had another answer to all questions, and it's a drug. Um but let's continue here with your question. So he wants to learn uh, front and overhead squats. When I try them, I feel like I am pushing my hips too far back, which makes it feel like I'm not balanced. I have videoed myself and my hips are pushed back. There is a forward lean and the bar is either in line or slightly behind the middle of my foot. I, I hope this makes sense. Any cues or suggestions to make corrections? Okay, first, <laughs> when you're learning how to squat, Goblet squat, goblet squat to overhead squat, overhead squat, front squat, and back squat. That's what I think. And I'm sticking with it. I think I'm, I, you know, it's the old Murtaugh thing. I'm too old for this stuff, if you watch How I Met Your Mother. Uh, there's a couple of things. First off, and this is going to be the hardest thing for you, Jason, is that when you transition after all those years of back squatting to the overhead and the front squat, you're going to go through a, a hard time because the load is going to be really, really light. I mean, you're going to have to back off a lot. And that is so hard. And I tell you, it's hard. It's hard on the ego. Uh, when I was in high school, we just back squatted. Well, if you want to call it squat, it was a quarter squat to, you know, eighth of a squat or a quarter squat, maybe a half squat. Um, but we did them all on our back. It was an easy transition for me when I went and trained with at the Pacifica Barbell Club because uh, I'd really never squatted before. So, you know, when you're doing snatches and cleaning jerks, you're getting in, you know, uh, 30, 40, 50 squats uh, on both of those lifts. And on Tuesday and Saturday, we go in front squats. So I'd kind of figured that out by then. So the first thing, the first point, and it's a tough one, and... You're not the first to go through this. Your ego is going to take a bit of a hit on the on the on the load. It's going to have the weight's going to go down. I mean, you might be struggling with just the empty bar. And hats off to you. It's okay. The first thing uh, when I see people leaning over excessively, the first thing I look at is their ankles. Uh, obviously, this is I'm I'm already out of my uh, what do they call it pay grade or you know uh, I'm out of my lane. Because I'm not really great at, um, I'm certainly not a physical therapist or a medical doctor, but my experience tells me that the first place I look is the ankles. And that's when you put lifts on the shoes or you just put your feet up on a two by four, pardon me, your heels on a two by four or your heels on a weight plate. And so that'll help instantly with your ankle flexibility. It's night and day with me. Uh, I kind of wish there was a magical shoe I could I could have where I would start my Olympic lifts like in discus throwing shoes, which are basically like ballet slippers. And then after I hit the weight, they would magically transform into fairly high heeled boots uh, because 
I need the flexibility at the bottom, uh, more so as I age. So the first thing is, is add, add lifts to your heels. Uh, that helps a lot of people. When I do my hands-on demonstrations, sometimes people are just shocked at the visual of when we have the athlete doing a body weight squat. Uh, let's imagine their face is this way. When they do a body weight squat and they get down in that kind of body weight goblet squat and they get down here like this, and then they wedge themselves out and they still have a pretty massive lean. And then we bring the heels in and that same person it goes vertical. It's just the way it is. The next thing I would like you to think about, so the heels on the first, the next thing I'd like you to think about is uh, something like, I mean, uh, Tim Anderson's original strength, the six point rock movement. Now, when you're doing the six point rock to help your squat, so all you're gonna do is you're gonna be on your hands, your knees, and then have your toes dug in. And as you rock in and out of that position, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, I suggest doing it on a carpet or something that's a little bit slicker. <laughs> uh, you know, whatever, whatever you have is fine. Uh, I, I don't suggest it on asphalt. Let your knees slide apart as you do it and just keep rocking yourself. And one of the things you might find out is that, and I don't wanna say it's groin flexibility or adductors or whatever. It really is almost that whole pelvic joint flexibility. And what you'll find as you're rocking for some people is that's when you start to pick up the fact that maybe your whole spinal column is tight. Now, I always think this with the spinal column, uh, if you're generally tight from, you know, kind of stem to stern, that's okay. But if you're tight in just one area, that's what I worry about a little bit. But the nice thing about it, if you're just really locked up in one area, that's where you get, oh, that's a good place to foam roll. That'd be a good place to do, uh, if you can get manipulated either by a, a chiropractor or uh, uh, those, those those big rollers that people now use a lot to get on and they do the, the poor man's chiropractor. Okay, so ankles lifts, six point rock, widening the knees out, searching for that area as you rock that tightens up. And the final one is the weird one but that is hanging. Uh, I think hanging really helps a lot of people squat, overhead squat, and in some cases front squat, but overhead squat. When you're hanging here, like I'll, I'll pop up there sometimes and do my 30 second hang. And about halfway through when I relax, I'll hit this little thunk. And, and you know, it's that old thrower issue that every thrower I know has. It's, you know, you can almost press it and, but it, it kind of releases, it pops, it does, you know, it adjusts itself, whatever. But a lot of people who struggle with overhead squats have have a tight, um, the, these, uh, in Chinese medicine, the hips and the shoulders are called the four knots, a K-N-O-T. Like a shoelace, you want to be tight enough, but tight enough to stay on, loose enough to come off. So with your shoulders, with a lot of people, the two knots here, is that they're they're not loose anymore and the dead hang will help. Now you'll notice the second I put my hands here, I'm already sliding over into the overhead squat position. So flexibility can be helped with your front squat and your overhead squat by lifts on the heels, addressing the mobility issue in the six point rock, doing the dead hangs. And then finally, I, I always, I used to put this first, but now I put it at last. If it comes to an issue with the wrists, then address the wrists then. We use Steve Ilg's Vents, V-E-N-T-S, where you spend you know, a fair amount of time you know, holding the wrists in this position uh, against. So you hold it in this position, you hold it in this position, you would hold it in this position, and you hold it in this position. We use the floor as resistance. Um, a lot of people, when they're, when they're doing their wrist flexibility work, all they're doing really is hitting their fingers, but we want wrist flexibility, not finger. Well, we want both. Um, an exercise I learned, uh, years ago, gosh, a long time ago, late seventies from a martial artist. Uh, you put your finger on your sternum, you grab the thumb, and then you pull the wrist down. Um, it is a form of wrist lock 
but it's also one of the best kind of wrist looseners I know. I, I know, and there's a number of questions today that are a little bit divisive or divisive, depending on where you're from. Um, and this can be one of them. I, I don't think the back squat is the answer to all questions, like, like many people do. And I don't want to hear that, you know, I don't want to hear, you know, fill in the blank word because I don't push squats. Folks, I do, I've done a lot of back squats in my, in my life. You know, I've done, I mean, I've done, you know, 50, 51 reps with 225. I've done 30 reps with 315, followed by 30 reps with 275, followed by 30 reps with 225. I mean, I built my size on back squats and I get that. I've always felt that the other side of that was that I also got that weirdly distended belly from it. Um, I don't think it, it carried over into throwing really at all. The late, great John Powell and I had that conversation. And of course, you couldn't get Brian Oldfield to shut up. And th the three of us all had that agreement that you don't want to be in that position as an athlete. You want to be more in this position. So um, I know for hypertrophy, back squats have great value. But I have to agree with something Clarence ba Bass said 30 years ago now. When you, if you do honest before and after measurements, not just photographs, but measurements. And now, of course, we have all these great new devices that are even better. But, you know, if you put on 40 pounds of body weight, it would be nice that 39.5 of those pounds would be lean body mass, but that's just not what happens. When people bulk up, they tend to very often just fatten up. It's like these new drugs that people are taking, and now we're just, just uh, to for for size loss. Now we're discovering that most of the weight you lose in these drugs is lean body mass, not fat. So, I mean, if you're taking these pills, good for you, but boy, long term. Lean body mass is, is one of the great answers to the aging issues. Um, being active, keeping your brain active, and keeping your lean body mass up. Those are the three big ones, is what I'm taught at the Senior Center. So I, I hope that helps. Uh, those are some ideas. Um, I think there's some clarity there. We did go from a bottom to top progression. Uh, that's not bad. But... Y you're also gonna just gonna to have to realize, Jason, that you're probably gonna to have to take a little bit more time on this than really most people want to do, but it'll be so worth it when you get the over. Doing the overhead squat, you don't give us an age or anything, but let's just, let's say you're over 35, let's just say that. Overhead squats after 35, the mobility, the flexibility issues, that help, that, that how it helps mobility and flexibility issues, uh, what it does for, which it does for your balance. Uh, Phil Maffetone now is recommending them too. And when Phil Maffetone recommends something, and I usually think I'm in pretty good company when we're thinking the same way. Gosh, I hope that helps, Jason. This is a common question, but it's always a good question. So thank you. Yeah, uh, Levi asked a question and... Uh, it's very short, but uh, it's it's. The, I think there's a good a good story. I don't know if I have a good answer, but I have a good story here. I'm wondering what's the best way to be a professional in strength training or athletics in general. I love training; would love to do it professionally. Well, okay, there's <laughs> there's a small issue that jumps right up. Uh, I don't uh, paying for the other things in life are difficult when you coach. Uh, it's frankly, um, when I came up as a coach, uh, started coaching in 1979. Um, I don't, I think in a summer program one time, uh, I made 1400 bucks because, uh, Chris Long was the director. The next year we shifted directors and for the same amount of work, I got 400 bucks. Now I know you're all listening there and going, well, that's a lot of money. Well, it was four hours a day for eight weeks and I got 400 bucks. And that's the way coaches were treated for a long time. Uh, it's interesting to hear uh, what strength and conditioning coaches are making now versus what I made in 1979. Uh, if 
if you want to be professional in strength uh, training, I, I think you have many more options now. Uh, I work at St. Mary's in Twickenham, London. I also consult with Parker University down in Dallas. And what makes the reason I bring this up is both the schools have master's degrees in basically strength and conditioning. Uh, the names might be a little different. Uh, human performance sometimes uh, is another name you'll hear, but we're to a place in, in the field where you can get advanced degrees in strength and conditioning. Um, if you want to be a professional, if you are my age, if you're, um, and I'm, you know, I'm in my 60s, I'm retired, I've been doing this, you know, a long time. If you're my age, basically the m number one thing you had to have was keys to the weight room. Uh, that was the key. That was the big one. <laughs> the key was the key. Um, <laughs> if you opened the door and you sat in the chair, you became a strength coach. Uh, I think I was a little bit better, more qualified for that. Uh, and I know long term it helped because I read a lot of books, talked to a lot of people, took a lot of courses. So I, I knew I, I knew what happened to fat and I knew how fat would burn, which is, you know, as you know, out, if you do the research, you don't burn fat in a sense, you, you kind of breathe it out, honestly. Um, I, I knew a lot about different uh, strength traditions and different cultures. I knew about health practices and different cultures because I read a lot, talked to a lot of people. Uh, I still think there's great value in the path I took. You go in the weight room, you work with some people, you make some mistakes, you do some good things, you fix the bad things, you just, and you just keep course correcting through your career. So I'm gonna put that down as one of the pillars, is the idea that you gotta go into the weight room, you gotta go into the, uh, you, were, you were a little bit general, you said strength conditioning or athletics, you gotta be on the field to play, you gotta be on the court, you gotta be on the mat, whatever the sport is, and you gotta be out there, you've gotta put the time in, and you got to listen to people who, who've been there, done that. Um, well, I've had the opportunity to sit down with, you know, some of the best coaches in the world. I had this wonderful afternoon one time with Bob McKittrick. And Bob, I think, had four Super Bowl rings from the San Francisco 49ers. And he talked to me about, uh, of course, he had Joe Montana as a quarterback and, you know, Jerry Rice and Roger Craig. I mean, Brett Jones, I mean, this was a superstar team. And he told me about how you put together a passing attack, but how you block it. And he, and it was interesting to listen at that level to think about what we were doing and about how the blocking scheme really truly related into the patterns the receivers were running and, and what the quarterback needed. I mean, when he was done talking, I had more questions. But I couldn't ask any questions because my mind was just turning and turning and turning. Just not many months later, I looked back on that conversation and all I did was kind of nod along at my notes and go, now I understand, now I understand. So sometimes I'd like you to get challenged by the best and the brightest in whatever sport or in strength conditioning. But then remember, you kind of always bring it back to your specific location, your specific gym setting, um, and the environment and, and the neighborhood that you're coaching in. So list, listen to the best and brightest, adapt and develop locally, and just keep repeating the process. Okay, that's kind of that's kind of pillar number one. Pillar number two is something I didn't have an opportunity to do. If possible, I would love to see you get a. Uh, a, a I, I don't know where you're from, Levi, but uh, here in the United States, we say a bachelor's and a master's degree. The nice thing about the modern master's degrees in in our schools is that you also get certified uh, with this uh, organization. I always find it fascinating um, with these organizations that you have to research. On the academic side, you know, you don't get a doctorate degree and like a few years later they say, you, you got to fill out a form, pay us money to keep your doctorate. But in the certification world, that's what they do. They give you two years, three years, whatever. It is interesting that I have several lifetime certs in there and uh, to organizations who would be embarrassed to consider me a member, but I've got the lifetime certs, so there you go. Um, if the bachelor's, master's route is not appropriate for you, you know, I then I would turn to the cert route. Um, 
I, I think the kettlebell cert is a really good one, and I'll tell you why. Uh, the kettlebell cert, I work with the RKC. The nice part about it is it's uh, the HKC is a one day, the RKC is two. But the nice thing is there's a curriculum, there's a plan, there's a vision, there's standards. It's, you know, this, 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 and this. And there's value to that because uh, once you once you uh, get into an organization, you follow the rules, you do what they did. I, I've also done this with Fit Ranks, with the FMS. Um, gosh, there's a couple of others I've been to. A number of organizations. Um, every if I'm there, will give me credit uh, that they uh, borrowed my push pull hinge squat loaded carry mixed with mobility paradigm, and that's fine. I mean, invented it. Uh, I stole it like every master thief. Um, but, you know, th there is great value to going to these one or two day certs, you know, getting yourself, uh, you know, dipped into the waters of what they're teaching. And then again, you have to take it home to your place, to your locality, to your population, adapt and teach again. And then, of course, there's the third area. So, I'd you know, ideally, you know, you <laughs> ideally you make one phone call, you find a mentor for life, they bring you over, you you know, you live in this great place, and you get your meals paid for, and you know, you're just everything's perfect and good for you. Uh, the rest of us have to do it this way. So, so get get the key to the weight room, get a, the best education you possibly can, and number three is you got to read, but you got to read with a very discerning mind. Um, you know, I, I had someone online make fun of the fact that I refer to my books all the time. Why would, what kind of idiot would argue that a person refers to books? How, what is the, okay. I, I think it's very important you read books. Uh, I like older magazines. I don't like the newer stuff. All right, you kids in your new magazine. Um, you got to be careful about certain websites. You got to be careful about certain magazines. You got to be careful about certain books. But the one thing about a book that I like is that the person had to stop, organize, put it in one place, and in a sense, you know, either press a button or, or put it in the mail, send it to somebody, and it's done. You know, Pat Flynn and I have these very nice conversations about one of the books he wrote, which I think is outstanding. But I've also, I'm very heavily criticized. I, my my review on it on, actually, I went in and I edited my review because I was a little too negative about the book. I praised it, but it was also very negative about the book. So I went in and, and, and I edited it a bit more just so I wouldn't come off as a total, you know, jerk. But you know, the night and Pat and I have talked many times about this particular book because I think it's his best work. And but he has some really good foundational ideas there. But he needs to tweak. Say, say 80, I would say 80, 90% of the maybe even higher than 90% of the book is that's really good. But then that 10%, and I would only argue it's the programs, because I did the I did all 180 days of his programs. Uh, so I know, I know what's good and bad about the book. It was just it, some of them. I'll give you a quick example. He has a lot of complexes in the workouts and some of the complexes are so complex that you couldn't, it was really hard to train because you'd be doing like, okay. And then you don't, you'd have to follow along. Uh, you'd have to almost have, you had to follow along on it. It was just really complicated. You know, my uh, complexes with kettlebells, I don't like going over three exercises. With barbells, I can keep it at five because with the barbell exercises, like, you know, if you're doing, uh, it just makes it's easy to do with five. I, and I, I don't know why. Uh, I don't know why. My snatch complex is four exercises, my clean complex is four, and my body fat burning complexes are five. I don't know why. Well, yeah, because it, it flows. So getting back to the point about Pat is that his book is outstanding. He put it out there and then we dialogued and Pat and I had came up with some great ideas for the next version of it, which I, I don't know if he's going to do it, but he certainly shares it online. 
So those are the things. Those would be the three pillars. Get in there, number one. Number two, do your best to get an education, whether weekend certs or classwork. And number three, do your best to read and interact with what you read as best you can. Uh, and then maybe on top of that would be mentors, um, you know, fellow travelers on the road. But it's always it's always hard to figure out. Uh, you you got, you have to prepare yourself for the best mentor of your life. You just can't. You'll you'll never know how. Like in my case, I was very lucky for the people I bumped into. But then I look on the four or five years before that, how I prepped myself to be ready. When I first Dick knew, met Dick Notmeyer, I knew his home address because of reading about him in Strength and Health magazine. So that's, you know, that's your due diligence that you have to do to prep yourself for a good mentor or teacher. And if you get good mentors and good teachers, well, it really seems to help. I hope that helps. We have a question from Martin. I am a novice weightlifter and I've been doing easy strength at home while our gym was closed because of the fire in the past few months. I'm sorry about that. I came back to PR of 45K in the snatch. Yay for me. But now I broke my leg at work. Tibia and fibula both uh, broken fully through. Yee. Four places in all. Assuming I can walk pro properly again in the future, what is the best way to strength train in my way out, out of this? I have experimented with seated presses, rows, and good mornings to avoid stressing the injured leg. Also, the best exercises that the, 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 the PT told me to do, clamshells, knee extensions, and leg raises. What's your advice? Well, I am a big believer in strength training after surgeries and after injuries. The only issue is try to leave the injured limb alone which gets us immediately back to the big question of why it's so hard to recover from spinal injuries because it's hard to avoid the spine. Pretty easy to, if you have a bad ankle, we can do a lot, I mean, a lot of training. If you hurt your wrist as I have, I've had two wrist surgeries, yeah, you can do just about everything, ish. But if you hurt your spine, you run out. But yeah, so here's the advice I give you. Train as hard as you physically can on all the unaffected limbs. Uh, it does it does seem strange, but remember, if I have a broken left wrist and I'm doing one arm presses and I'm doing one arm rows, all that magical stuff that runs through my body also runs through my injured side too. Uh, I've told the story many times of Dr. Vanderhoof when I came in after my wrist surgery, the one after he told me I'd never lift weights again, and uh, he said, I'd never be able to do that again. Okay, see that? I can't do that. And he looked at me and said, I've never seen a client improve like this. And I said to him, I'm doing exactly what you told me to do. And he kind of smiled. He said, I don't think I've ever had a client do that before. So if you're doing all the exercises that your PTs are telling you to do, all the exercises your doctor told you to do, and you're doing your best to just get old fashioned strong, it's gonna help a lot. Now, we can't predict the future, but what you can do right now um, on, I don't know if you're ever gonna snatch again. I don't know if you're ever gonna walk again. I mean, ideally you should, but okay, let's, we can't predict what's gonna happen long-term, but for the right now, the best thing you can do, get your sleep, drink your water, eat your veggies, take your protein, and exercise the unaffected limbs as best you can, and then do what the exercises, those local exercises to rehab the injury as best you can. It's, it, it's that simple. I mean, it truly is. And, I, and, and good luck to you. I would like to know long-term uh, how things go on that, okay? Thank you. Well, Oli asks a question that's, I don't know how well I can answer this. As a strength coach and religion teacher, what do you think is the most impressive feat of physical strength in religion or mythology and why? Well, I mean, I don't know how true the stories were, but 
when I was young, I got a lot of, I took a lot out of the stories of Theseus. Now, they were kids' versions of the story, so it kind of kept out what a kind of a jerk he was. But uh, Theseus was a small, a small boy, and he had issues with bullies. And he, I can't remember, but his one of his parents was a god. And uh, so they sent him a lesson. And uh, the lesson was, this is the story I read in a, is the seagull grab, couldn't peck through. The, this is the lesson. He was sent to seagull. The seagull couldn't possibly peck through a clam. So the seagull flew up really high, dropped the clam on rocks, and came down and ate the clam meat. And Theseus watched this for a while before he understood that you use, you use your enemy's strength to, to win. So when he fought the Minotaur, he, he in the story I read, uh, he, used, he used the Minotaur's own strength and aggressiveness against him. And of course, ultimately, uh, he broke off, the, the, the Minotaur ran into a wall, broke off one of the, the, the horns, and Theseus took him out with, uh, with the, his own horn, his own strength. Um, I, I've always, that was a story that really reached out to me the most. And it prepared me for this book back here, The Sword and the Stone, because I think what T.H. White does so well is it really shows our hero, young Arthur, who's called Wart in the book, because it because of Sir Kay, a bit of a bully figure who obviously changes over time. And I've always been a big fan of that that cycle of story. And you see it, of course, you see it in uh, you see it with Luke Skywalker, you know that the famous line Princess Leia says, "Aren't you a little small to be a stormtrooper or something like that?" So for me, I've always been more of a fan of, and it happens a lot in history where uh, the, the, the weak, the oppressed, uh, overcome all the barriers and, and win the day. So those would be mine only. Uh, uh, of course, uh, I don't know, of, uh, there's not too many places that don't have a tradition along those lines. Um, so yeah, fun, fun, fun question. Didn't expect it. Thanks so much. Uh, Hamish, Hamish asks in podcast number 188 at 605. Wow. Uh, you mentioned about kettlebell exercises that should be avoided. So my question is, are there any barbell exercises that you believe should be banished and placed in the Dan John university, uh, dumpster? You know, it's, it's an interesting question, and I'll tell you why. When I was young, books like the Track and Field Omni book would come out, and they would have all these lists of exercises you shouldn't do. And then, like five years later, they would put the name Russian on it or, you know, uh, Bulgarian on it. That same exercise that you should never, ever do was now something you should do. There's one called the Russian goalie deadlift or something like that where you pick the weight up here go center put it down there and it's all that bending and twisting that we're not supposed to do uh so i have to be a little careful uh, hamish uh on this because i'd hate to be the guy who says never do this um the first thing i would do uh, let's just start in a weird place the barbell isn't designed for most of the people who listen to my podcast uh, the barbell is too low to the ground and the collars aren't wide enough for the modern audience. Uh, watching these six foot five guys try to do snatches, six foot six guys, uh, you know, these collegiate athletes. Uh, uh, it's funny because the bar, the collars are way too narrow. They're too narrow for me. It's six foot. When I Olympic lift up, the, as I said in the podcast many times, very often my snatches, I'll finish with just this inside the, still on the knurling, and my two outer fingers basically caressing the inner collar. And I'm only six foot. Uh, so there are limitations to the, to the piece of equipment we're using. 
And obviously I try to work with that with my taller athletes using uh, racks, using, uh, a, you know, uh, uh, when I say uh, stacks, you know, stacks of boxes, so you can lift on boxes. Um, uh, boy, watching seven foot five guys try to do a chin up and a standard chin up uh, setup was kind of funny because they, <laughs> it's, it's a, they go up like this to the bar and then they have to drop down and, you know, they're, they're just so tall. Um, so the first thing is just kind of remember the, the limitations of the barbell themselves. In, in my humble opinion, there, there really are no bad barbell exercises and there are a lot of barbell exercises, but the hack squat, for example, which uh, hack clearly told us he didn't invent, but it means heel in German or something like that. But that's that exercise where you hold the bar behind you and then you do squats with a pronounced forward knee bend. Well, I mean, people look at that and say, well, doesn't that shear off the patella tendon? And I'm like, well, and then you ask this guy, does that, does that hurt your knees? Person number A, uh, person number A. Wow, that happened fast. The first person will say, no, my knees feel great. The second person is crying in agony over an exercise. The sissy squat based on Sisyphus, of course, you know, uh, I had, I remember someone trying to teach me how to do it and all it did was just burn my knees. I mean, I was in, you know, I, I've had patella tendonitis and it was that moment where I, I thought my patella was going to pop off. So I'm, I'm using the, I'm using those knee exam. So some people are, are built to do hack squats. Um, I, when I was young, everybody did behind the neck presses. Well, now if you do a behind the neck press, the, the, uh, the exercise, um, uh, police sprint into the gym, kick you out and say, you should never do it. But everybody I knew who was older than me in the gym did behind the neck presses when I was young. And now we can't do them at all. But I would argue it's because we've been doing so many bench press and push ups that we've lost that ability to do this. Um, I know some people who do just something as simple as a shoulder shrug will make their necks hurt for days. So my first point was the equipment itself. My second point is the human person. And we're just individual enough that you might do an exercise that really knocks you up to the next level. I might do the exercise and just say, this hurts. And I gotta tell you folks, if it hurts, don't, don't do it. The third thing is this, is that I don't even know of an exercise that doesn't have short-term value. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, did an easy strength protocol doing, now he called them Jefferson deadlifts. Now you, um, let's just make sure what I'm saying is what, so it's when you step over the barbell with one foot. So you're in a lunge position, you put your hands down and you deadlift up uh, kind of between your legs. Now, that's an exercise uh, I haven't done very many times in my life. But then um, if you go to an exercise that's even close to it, uh, so that variation is something I've never done. But here's an exercise many of us did as kids. And of course I can't find it right now. Oh, is this variation here where the person is gonna deadlift off the floor, is gonna deadlift off the floor with the hands fore and aft versus this way. Well, we did that one as lots of kids because with the old standard barbell, uh, that was a good way to work your legs. After this person showed me this, this, this easy strength idea with what he called a Jefferson lift, I went and tried a few of those, you know, lungy deadlift variation, and I really liked it. I was like, oh, I, I like this. I, I, I like what it does. It made me, it, it really challenged my mobility, and it really challenged me in an areas of strength I don't think I ever played much at. So it comes down to this. There's equipment problems with a the barbell. There's the physical problems that you might like this, I might hate this. And then number three 
is that in a small dose, I think any exercise is pretty good. Um, to the point that if you just decided to maybe have a two week, ex you know, every two weeks, just sprinkle in one of the old exercises you don't see very often. Uh, it's funny as I got this book here, I was flipping through. Uh, he has uh, barbell pullovers. I haven't seen those in years. Uh, behind the neck press, side bends, shoulder shrugs, uh, alternating press, the alternating the seesaw press. Now that's an exercise I wish I could get more people to do more often. Um, Joe Weider's magazine, All-American Athlete, had an article one time that said if you could only do one thing, the alternating press would be the exercise. Uh, in our facility, we do that walking. So you do this walking seesaw press, um, which um, certainly makes your body have a conversation. But it is funny to see these 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 exercises that have been, been around a long time. They'll keep coming back. Exercises to avoid, avoid. After going through the three points I made, I don't really want to say any exercise, but I will agree with the track and field Omni book. Any exercise that gets you twisting and bending your spine under load you probably can do, but I would take a lot of time building up to it. So if you're going to do that Russian goalkeeper deadlift, really take some time. Maybe use uh, light dumbbells, light kettlebells, learning it. Take your time building up to it. And then constantly ask your question as you're doing this uh, exercise. Is, you know, Make sure it's worth it. Make sure it's worth it at some level. Okay, thanks. So we got a question from Bryce. He says this, and it's a it's a, it's a big question. So hang in there, folks. I recently became a homeowner a couple of years ago in the Denver area, and rent out rooms in my house. Because I'm the sort of person who listens to your podcast, I've outfitted the gym with a squat rack, barbells, kettlebells, dumbbells, TRX, pull up bars, ab wheel, etc. Most of my tenants are moving to the to Denver to hike, climb, ski, kayak, mountain bike, etc. They tend to be in pretty good shape, but most of them, especially the women, have little to no experience lifting weights. And that will be, and I think you're going to notice in the next few years that that becomes a statement you hear less and less. Um, I'm very impressed with the number of women, young women I see uh, training in literally every facility I go into, whether it's a hotel gym, a school facility, or uh, a commercial gym. Question number one. I have often thought that a great way to get them started would be with your six-week Squat 101 program from Mass Made Simple. So basically, uh, three days a week, you goblet squat. Um, and yeah, that's... I mean, I got to tell you, if three days a week you goblet squat and, and you take the workout seriously for six weeks, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. Um, but I'm wondering what modifications you would make to the program for women. Since my dumbbells are adjustable, I've considered that each set might increase only two and a half pounds and five pounds. Very good idea. In the original program, you note that the trainee should be shooting for a triple digit goblet squat in their last session. What would be the equivalent for women? Well, uh, Paul Isingo, uh, he had the 16 kilos for 10. So the, the, that was his one of his first standards for females. Uh, one of them was, you know, perform an appropriate squat and then 16 kilos for 10. I've, I've thought that was a good, yeah, you're, it's that, okay, it is a good, you're doing okay standard. You're doing okay standards are sometimes okay. You know, they're pretty good by themselves. So think 35 pounds for 10. From there, think 24 kilos, uh, 53 pounds for 10, 50 pounds for 10. And then from there, you know, we might be looking for another tool set, toolkit. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of strength standards. Uh, uh, we, I think in every book, gosh, I, I got it. Probably every book I've written since the original Easy Strength. And I know it's in the Easy Strength Omni book. I've included my high school standards. Um, and, and it's interesting because when I think about them, so we kept going back and forth between whether our female military press standard should be 70 or 75 pounds. And 
I've had people ask me, well, isn't that really light? And I'm like, how many teenage female lifters do you know, military press? Because, you know, I think at the time when I came up with those standards, I was probably in the low thousands of high school female athletes I had trained. And when they hit 70 or 75 pounds, that usually was like the first great standard for them that got them thinking they were strong. Obviously in the deadlift, the, the female teenage athlete can do a lot more. Um, the squat, they can do a lot more, but the press just was a stagger. So when you're looking at standards, you gotta be careful because uh, for one thing on, on, on the women's side, I honestly don't think we have enough numbers yet. Um, you know, when I work for bigger, bigger, faster, stronger, you know, we had this minimal number for a high school football player. I think it was, I think they had 175 pounds for me. Uh, my minimum standard for a high school football player is 205 pounds. Um, I, there's a lot of reasons for that. Their squat number was like 350 and my squat number was 255. That's a huge difference. Uh, because I wanted I wanted deeper squats and I didn't want, I wanted deeper squats with very few spotters. And I wanted, I wanted to be able to see the, the, the clean, the, the cleanliness of the lift was just as important to me as making, you know, um, what Brett Jones calls ugly style. I love that. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to see the squat go, vroom, vroom, you know, uh, for the high school athlete. I want to see all the lifts be very machine-like. I don't want to see a lot of flipping and rotating and turning and whirling and all the other nonsense you see online when kids are maxing. That's all just, you're all just one minute from an injury there. So when we're talking about standards, realize that we don't have a lot of numbers yet. What I have for a teenage female athlete isn't going to be the same as a 35-year-old woman executive. Uh, there could be some changes. But the idea is, the one idea I'd like you to think about is look at your equipment and then make standards for your facility based on what you have in your gym. Um, when we, the big blue and the big, the big silver club, uh, we had colored uh, bumper plates. So uh, blues were 45 pounds, 20K. Greens were 35s. Reds were 25, maybe, uh, whatever it was. But so all the standards were based on the colors of the plates and the organization. Um, that's why it was 255, is because that was a, a blue plate, a green plate, and a red plate. So it looked kind of nice. And it just, it was just this, this mental thing we kind of came up with. Uh, towards, you know, I, always, I used to know when we were doing really well is when the, when the boys, and I know, Aldo Espinoza and I think Devin Callis came up with this as we put up all the standards in the big blue club. Now, if this is good coaching, I don't, I don't think what I'm about to say is, you know, all is nothing but good ideas, but this was good. Say, I think there was nine lifts that they had to do and they set up. So they had a platform with the 315 deadlift. They had a platform for the uh, 205 clean. They had a set up a rack with a 205 front squat and they just, yeah, 100 and 165 pound uh, clean and jerk. And what they did is they said on mark, you set go. And they, well, this isn't the healthiest thing, but they did, they did, they, they had good, great technique. They raced to see who could, how fast you could do the big blue club. Of course, that made me then get into another challenge where they had like, a, I think it was called the blue Eagle club or something like that where you had to do that challenge plus another challenge in a day. And, and you're just constantly trying to mix and remix how people get stronger. That's how I got high school athletes to work harder without really getting themselves too broken. And also moreover, more important, uh, both of them, uh, Aldo, Aldo was a, a division one cheerleader and Devin was a division one javelin thrower. Um, and, uh, I, I hope long-term neither of them has any injuries caused by, you know, overloading them as teenagers. So, okay. So that was the first question. That's pretty good to sum up that, that, that first question, make sure your standards are appropriate to the gym that you're in 
And sometimes my numbers are going to be higher and lower than yours because of the facilities you have. If you're a climbing gym, don't use my pull-up numbers. If you're a climbing gym, don't use our deadlift or snatch numbers. Okay, thanks. Question two. Do you have any recommendations for workouts or programs that work well for groups where the goal is somewhere between look better, move better, feel better, and get strong and start light? Easy strength comes to mind. Well, actually, a better idea is if you go to the Dan John University, I'm sure it's available at all these PDF places online, and don't pay for this thing. It's a free thing. I have the Coyote Point Kettlebell Club booklet. The Coyote Point Kettlebell Club, uh, when I moved to California there for a while, Dan Martin called me up and said, let's get a workout in. I said, where? He said, how about, I found a park near your house, Coyote Point. I got there Monday afternoon. Tuesday morning, I went down to Coyote Point and uh, worked out with Dan and a bunch of other people, great people. I met so many people, they would come. We only had one negative experience with anybody ever at the club. And she, uh, yeah, she was just, she was just rude. And, but that's pretty good. But in there, you'll see what we do. Uh, one of the things we always, you, you, I would, oh, I would have some kind of ritual. Our ritual uh, was it was kind of silly. We, I had two rules, I would say. Rule number one: don't get hurt. Rule number two: don't get hurt. Ha 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 ha. Then we'd all introduce ourselves. We'd say, "I'm Dan. I'm 65. I, I have blue eyes. I have golden hair. You know, whatever. You know, I'm a strength coach. Um, I write books, and I have you know three grandchildren." Then it would be Dan Martin's turn. You know, he's a firefighter, Oakland. Steve Ledbetter, blah, 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 Bob, Joan, Ed, Edna, you know, whatever. You introduce yourselves, and then you can either do it in the introduction, or what I like best is then say, I'm just here to get a nice workout in. Do you have any needs? Do you have any needs? And sometimes someone would say something like, I need to work on that or this, and we would all focus our attention on them. Um, I think when you're in a group setting, the group becomes, uh, I. this is something I learned in teaching, that every class is an organism. You know, I used to call them amoebas, but you know, I guess that's a little inappropriate. I guess, I don't think so. But every if you teach three classes of uh, modern European history, each class is gonna be weirdly different. Each class, you'll find that certain lectures go well. When the next class comes in, it's a bomb, and the third time you lecture on it, you're somewhere in the middle. And then, of course, that switches around. So with groups, the group itself has a dynamic. So, and every workout can be a little bit different. So in the Coyote Point Kettlebell Club, in the free PDF that's at the site, look at it, see what we did. Basically, I would say this, you know, um, I would start with... Uh, the introductions, uh, a reasonably easy kind of friendly warm up. I would use original strength now. Uh, a first mini workout. This is a great time to do half kneeling presses, goblet squats. Okay. Uh, then a, a mobility tweak or something somebody learned at a workshop or something somebody wants to share. Then you'd have a, a harder workout. The humane burpee is a great example. Armor building complex, another nice example. Remember, we're out in a field, so kettlebells work the best out there. Okay, so now we're, you know, now we're doing this hard workout. After the hard workout is a wonderful time to work on anything that needs love. It can be a flexibility period, it can be a mobility period. And then at the end, one of two things. You can do a finisher kind of thing. We we moved away from that, or you do a kind of a bigger mobility thing. Uh, with groups now, uh, I love anything that involves uh, high knees, butt kickers, running backwards. Running backwards is great. I'm a person of metal, so running backwards puts no strain on me. Mixed with an exercise, mixed with some fun. If you have a Frisbee, play ultimate for a while, whatever it is, but make sure that last little unit is fun. And then after that, have Dan Martin make uh, egg salad sandwiches for you. And uh, I have a few things I miss in my life, but I do miss Dan's egg salad sandwiches. We would sit around and eat lunch after that. 
talk, people would stay. Say the workout lasted an hour, people would stay up to two hours after just talking and asking questions. I think those questions I was asked after the workouts are what propelled me, I think, to be a better coach. Because after the workout is when people seem to have better clarity about what to do in the workout. Okay, question number three. Are we still we still on the same questions? Any general tips for encouraging the growth of a positive and successful community, both in and out of the gym? Well, I, I've given you the big answer already. I have this wonderful thing called the inner circle. Folks, I'm, I'm amazed how few people uh, take advantage of, of the Dan John University dot com inner circle it's just such a great group of people and you know maybe maybe there's only that many great people in the world that uh, but there's a couple of things you i've learned a lot now you, you got to be a little careful because when the book iron john came out i think it was by robert bly uh, a lot of people took the men's movement and kind of made fun of it but there were some things about these these meetings that i thought were really excellent uh, for one thing I thought was really good, um, and, and I'm just going to share a couple ideas with you. The first is this. You always introduce yourself and you always bring yourself up to. So every time in the inner circle, anytime I do any kind of, 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 of group, group, not like, you know, kettlebell cert, but like we're trying to move to another, you know, a, a life group. I always start off, I'm Dan, this is my age, this is where I'm from, here's what's going on in my life, here's what my training's been like, here's what I'm trying to accomplish, here are my struggles. And then we turn to the next person, it's Bob, she's Jean, you know, she's Edna, whatever. Always start off by reintroducing yourself each and every time. There's good reasons for that. First, most people don't remember your name week in, week out. It's just, you know, things happen. Uh, the number of people who think my name is Don or John is as many as people think my name is Dan. Um, and that's why you reintroduce yourself. But also, too, it becomes very welcoming for new members. Um, if you want a good community, um, <laughs> you know, it's what we used to talk about with the Dead Sea and the Great Salt Lake. And the reason the Dead Sea is dead is all it does is take water. It doesn't let any out. Um, mistakes group have groups have is the exact same thing. You know, we're going to have this group. We're going to meet. We're going to meet. We're going to meet. Um, many church groups I know have Bible study groups. And that's great. They're Wednesdays at 9 o'clock. Well, who can go to a Bible study group Wednesdays at 9 o'clock? People who have Wednesday at 9 o'clock off. And then the group meets. And they meet. And some of them meet. But people die. People leave. People come back. But the groups keeps meeting, the group keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So in a in a good organization, this is something I, I think I'm qualified to work with. This is what I used to do as an administrator. There's always this core group that does all the hard work. And then there's people who show up sometimes, and then there's people who show up in church work. It's called Christmas C and E's, Christmas and Easter. And then there's everybody else in the out. Well, what you need is a funnel to get people who or not in our community, into our community. Those who are into our community be show up more often in our community. People who show up more often begin to do more. And those who do more give them exits out so they don't always have to be in charge of everything. When you're, when you're teaching, when, when you're in a group, you're actively t teaching the person who's going to take your job over next year. Now, a lot of people don't want to give up. It's like the, if you live in an HOA community, there's always that one, eh, I, gotta be, I didn't want to say the sex of the person, but there's always that one individual. This is the most important person they've ever had, uh, job they've ever had in their life. And they're going to wield that job with power. You don't want that in group settings. So you want to make sure people come in and there's a logical amount of time. I like, of course, I like Fibonacci numbers. I like groups to meet for eight weeks. Uh, if you want to extend that, 13 weeks. But then after that, hard stop, reboot it in, a, in five weeks. 
Hard stop, reboot. Hard stop, reboot. I want you to think about that in training groups too. And if you are going to try to get a little depth, this isn't a good example, but you should have some kind of device like this. Uh, I, say, I actually have a very large talking stick that I use when we use, but we'll just pretend this is a talking stick. When I have this in my hand, I'm the only person allowed to talk. If you're going to have a group setting for exercise and then you want to have a little thing after to help talk about goals or whatever, have a talking stick. One of the most incredible things I ever saw in my life is when uh, I was on a faculty uh, group and we met for good reasons. One of us was really struggling. We were all committed to helping them. And one time I saw a man. They gave him the talking stick and he held it. He stared at it, he squeezed it. He looked down, cried, nodded his head. I mean, we're talking minutes. No one said anything. And then he said it maybe two or three sentences, if at most. And everyone went like this after. And he told me it's the first time he's been able to just gather his thoughts and speak in a long, long time. And I thought that was a beautiful story. You know, I, I had a I had a pretty brutal speech impediment as a kid. And <laughs> when I talk about it, it comes back. And um sometimes sometimes even now I I just want to I just <laughs> you wouldn't know it from the podcast. But there are times where let me just speak. And to do that, having a talking stick helps immensely, okay? So that would be something. Organize it that there's this. I hope you see how I'm organizing it. So there's there's everybody else on the planet. There's those who are in the community. There's those who show up. There's those who do the work. Find ways to keep pulling people around. Always introduce yourselves, always reintroduce yourselves, always welcome new people. Um, make sure the people who show up have jobs, but even as they're having jobs, they're already taking the new person and saying, "We, when we get here, we bring the kettlebells out. Let me show you how to do that. <laughs> I will watch you take the kettlebells back or whatever it is, okay? I, gosh, I hope that helped. There was a, there was a lot of there was a lot of questions there, but I felt like that was a nice opportunity uh, for me to go get some depth. And I, and I appreciate that more than you know. Well, this question I've been putting off for a while, but let's do it. Marty asks, I don't know if this came on your radar, but Steve Maxwell said he got disillusioned with kettlebells because his ex-wife got injured when doing snatches. And he says the only safe exercises are body weight ones. What are your weights? What are your thoughts on this? You know, I've met Steve. I, I like Steve. Steve's the person who actually really taught me how to use kettlebells for mobility work. You know, one of the reasons I got into kettlebells because Steve, you know, was such a proponent of them. I, I really liked what he taught me. Um, you know, the... It's it's interesting because, you know, that the, the halo, for example, I still think is one of the best shoulder exor mobility exercises. That I learned that from Steve. Yeah, I heard the comments he made, and um, um, I've been on the podcast of the place that he made the con uh, comments. I think, um, or it was just a follow up, one of the two. But I've commented on this before. Steve also mentions me in that little uh, uh, interview. And frankly, it bothered me because uh, Steve Steve knows Steve knows that my issues with my hips are from birth. Uh, it's, there's no woe is me on that. It's just it's called pistol grip hips, and people get it, and yeah, people get it in my family and other families. And it if if you have my DNA and you don't get total hip replacements. Um, I don't know. I don't know what you'd have to do because it is very, the you you I was I was grinding uh, bone on bone in high school football. So 1973, 74 is when I first heard clicks out of my hips. 
And I just thought it was a normal thing. So that's a long time. By the time I was at Utah State, the clicking would happen while I was sprinting. Uh, we would do sprint drills and I hear click, 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 click as I sprinted. Uh, I waited a, way too long to get it fixed. And Steve mentioned that, you know, somehow kettlebells caused that. Well, that's not true. Um, I, I'm, I don't, and this gets back to the, the real issue we're having now in, in the, the fitness industry, in the field here, I guess, is this, this, this weird moral theology that keeps showing up. Now, I don't like burpees. I don't like jumping jacks. I don't like lunges because I just don't like them. And I have my opinions about them. And you can go and, Dan John doesn't like burpees. And then you can ask some other person. If they're trying to make a name for themselves, they will say, man, burpees are the best fat burning. Yeah, okay. I've never seen anybody uh, get their body composition goals by doing burpees. Okay. Uh, I've seen a lot of people get their body composition goals by strict dieting and uh, resistance training, but not um, not burpees. And I, you know, just I'm just not a fan of a lot of exercises. So, and I get it. You know, one of the things people like to do for fun is, you know, take somebody else's program, ask me a question, then I say, well, you know, I'm not a big fan of, and you know the exercises, and then it gets out there, and then that. That person's acolytes then come into my uh, comment section. You know what you're talking about, bro, and all that stuff. And I and I and I actually I find it fascinating. I hate it, but I find it fascinating. But why do we have to be so divisive about everything? Um, listen, I love the hip thrust, and I saw somebody making fun of it the other day, and the person was clearly screwing around doing hip thrusts with exercise, and it's like. If do hip thrusts correctly and do them for a while, then make, I mean, if you want to, if you don't want to do hip thrusts, don't do them. If you don't want to do the Olympic lifts, what, where is it on the planet earth that they put a gun to your head and say, you will clean and jerk, you know, where is this place? If you don't like an exercise, and I don't like a lot of them because sometimes I get hurt doing these little exercises or I get sore in places I don't want to be sore in. Uh, patella tendon, uh, patella tendon would be number one. Achilles would be another one. And then anywhere around these, uh, the shoulder joints I don't like. And of course, if I feel my lower back or my mid back flare up, that's a little indicator. It's less of an indicator for me, but it's like, you know, be, be smart, be careful going into it. If you don't like a thing, don't do it. I mean, I get it. I mean, I, I have a big background in strength and conditioning. I know, I think I know my stuff in the weight room. I think I know my stuff in athletic performance. But so much of what I say is, it's like your opinion, man, to quote my good friend, the big Lebowski. Um, <clears throat> uh, how can I, an exercise tool in and by itself be good or bad? Um, you could, I mean, if you want, I know this body weight exercises can get you as injured as anything we do in the weight room. Um, I mean, I, we used to do tons of push ups um, in high school, tons of them. And one of the things a lot of us started to notice is when you were doing a lot of push ups and then you played uh, any of America's, most of America's games, which usually involved throwing of some kind is that you were always going, ow, my shoulder hurts. And many of my friends have permanent damage. I probably do too, but I don't, I pretend it doesn't hurt. Um, I mean, I mean, I remember when Hindu squats were the answers to all questions. Does anybody else remember the early 2000s besides me? Um, and it's interesting because the guy who pushed them the most also pushed in the weight room just doing clean and press, which I thought was still a great idea. So I don't want to, I mean, I enjoyed my time with Steve. I, I, I don't know what got him so anti, uh, anti kettlebell, but there's a story there. There's always a story folks. Um, I know he had issues with dragon door. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know much about what's happened since, but I mean, kettlebells, 
kettlebells, barbells, dumbbells, every piece of equipment you own, every piece of equipment at the gym, they all have value and they will always have value. And of course, it's what you do with it, how you use it is what, you know, makes it, does it fit your goals or not? Um, let's, let's, uh, let's end it there. Thank you. That was an interesting question, Marty. <laughs> and I, but I do appreciate it. Thanks so much. Well, listen, folks, that's it for today. Um, this was episode number 197. And uh, remember, if you have questions, you'll email me at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. And until next week, let's all keep on lifting and learning. And thank you. Bye-bye.